you could see a little sliver of uh, a moon the morning before we launched and that all went away you can see that uh, try number four we're uh, pretty well practiced at the suit room routine and uh, we're anxious and raring to go here They make you wave a lot. <laughs> we also got in step. You can see the fourth time we managed to get everybody in step, everybody in the, in the, proper, uh, in the proper alignment there for the, the walk out to the Astro van. Just, just after sunrise, uh, we got down to T minus three seconds, and the main engines uh, were still running. And uh, the vehicle was rocking back and forth, and you can see the SRVs lighting up, and uh, that's when I told Frank I was starting to be excited. And it was uh, sure an exciting liftoff, uh, shake, rattle, and roll, and uh, clearing the tower and everything was just an uh, incredible ride. The roll program and everything, uh, I, I don't think you've probably heard a more excited roll program call in the history of the shuttle program. <laughs> Just a spectacular day to go fly, uh, just like the other three opportunities had been. And you can see uh, we're just going straight on up there. There aren't even any uh, uh, perturbances to, um, to the plume there. I mean, it's just a, a spectacular day. This is uh, what I told everybody was going to be the train wreck, where the, the solids come off and there's a huge structural ring through the vehicle and everything else, but I guess uh, with all the rocking and rolling Discovery did on the pad, everything uh, came off very smoothly, including the external tank. And this is some great footage that Jim Newman got of the tank. Now we're in the post-insertion, doors are coming open, and we're about ready to get to work. Well, the first uh, item on our agenda was uh, the axe toss. Here is the, the axe toss being tilted up. We had already rotated uh, the ASC open. And uh, this is uh, uh, the F flight deck here. And uh, axe is all tilted up. Dan was uh, watching the currents uh, while we were uh, tilting up, watching the motors. And uh, he had his fingers crossed this would be the time to deploy. I hit the fire uh, switch, and uh, away she went. You can see this through a camcorder uh, video. is just uh, amazing visuals uh, as, as it came up and over uh, uh, the uh, flight deck and uh, out across the, uh, the ocean there and, and, the, uh, and the clouds. And this spacecraft is on station right now, uh, doing great during its checkout period. You can also see some of the uh, debris that came out, too. Uh, we had both uh, Super Zip uh, uh, explosive cords fire. So we, uh, and uh, that followed us around uh, during the mission a little bit. Now, uh, the axe toss was on a timer, and 45 minutes after the deploy, uh, Dan maneuvered the arm uh, around the uh, space shuttle and uh, around the, uh, on one of the wings to get this picture of the, uh, the toss motor burning and sending it up to uh, Earth orbit. At the end of the robotic arm are these wire snares, and that's the first half of a, a good grapple. And uh, what we do is maneuver it using this, this crosshaired target. And from that target, I can tell if, we're, if I'm off axis and I just get close enough, there's a pin on the grapple fixture what those, the wire snares will wrap around. That's the first half. And then they retract inside the end of the end effector and then give us a good grapple. There's Frank wiping a little sweat off my brow. <laughs> no pressure there. Here's the uh, Orpheus Spa's unbirth. Um, again, went, went very well. Much uh, tribute that much to the, the uh, great training that we went through here. Uh, flight deck was very crowded there. and. Uh, that was Carl maneuvering the IMAX camera. We tested the door of uh, SPAS prior to release. It was actually a command sent by the ground, but that's actually in, in the release position over the payload bay right now. Again, there's Mr. Bill in, in, uh, in Frank's seat. Unfortunately, he didn't get to, to look out the window quite as much as, as we did, but you'll see later here he gets kind of surprised by one of the uh, their surveys. and. Um, Again, this is prior to release, and at the moment of release, I uh, press a button and uh, or trigger switch, 
it opens this, the snares and, uh, and I pull away with the robotic arm. The next thing we're going to do is, uh, if you recall, the IMAX camera and the, uh, the EMU TV on there, we started getting, receiving that back. So this is the SPA, it's actually taking a look at the orbiter and we were able to set up and do all the maneuvers, uh, as you can see here, uh, and then this is us looking back at the spas as it takes pictures of us. And so what we're really looking forward to is when the IMAX film comes out, and I believe that there may be a general uh, screening of that sometime in the, uh, in the future for our JSC folk. It will be uh, looking like this, except for with IMAX quality. At night, of course, we, we were shining a flashlight at it in order to try to see if it could, could see us. One of the things we also did was a, a maneuver, the Rickle roll, Ted Rickle designed this one. It's all sped up a little bit here. It's blooming a little bit because of the, uh, the EMU TV camera it doesn't have the range of, of uh, in order to be able to handle all that. But the IMAX is supposed to have been set right and should handle this. And so you can get a number of different views of the orbiter as it does its uh, rotation before we then ended up doing our final separation away from the, uh, away from the spas and in order to go into our week-long sort of, uh, of uh, station keeping. So here we are, these are the payload bay lights on the orbiter, and there's that little flashlight that we were shining. Once the uh, Orpheus uh, spas uh, was deployed, uh, we had our LDCE experiment that we uh, activated. It's a getaway special a gas can. It has uh, material for, uh, uh, to be tested uh, for future uh, space applications, we called it Oscar and Albert. On the uh, DSOs, again, we saw this one earlier, there's the, the goggles going opaque, there's the targets, you can see the little laser. This is uh, the Advanced Lower Body Restraint Test, uh, affectionately known as Albert, and it, uh, it really benefited, especially myself, being a little bit shorter on the aft flight deck and uh, being able to, to uh, see out the window and, and reach all the controls of the RMS. It worked beautifully, and, it, and it, uh, here I am changing contacts. I was the only one who flew with contacts on the flight. It uh, took a while to get used to, to a, a technique that would work. And uh, what was kind of interesting is that the solution that I used, I actually preferred a thinner solution in space just because of the surface tension, which it kind of caught me by surprise. Fortunately, I brought both kinds with me, and it worked well. There's the uh, HRSGS, the High Resolution Shuttle Glow Spectrometer, just a demonstration of how easy it is to, to move large objects around in zero gravity. Here we are with uh, Dan doing his uh, cycle ergometer workout, and Bill decided to take a little jog with him. Uh, I think they covered about 12,000 miles uh, during a part of that. That was the low impact treadmill. The, uh, the opportunity to have a bite to eat after a, a long day, that squeeze steak I've got there is why I'm smiling. Uh, really quite good to uh, have a chance just to relax a little bit and uh, have a bite to eat down on the, on the mid-deck. These little Teddy Grahams, and uh, <laughs> there's a shark sequence with one of these where one of them disappears. Uh, I think that got cut out of this. We also, in, in, uh, uh, with deference to our many medical experiments. We had a guinea pig on board, that's how we sort of felt. And uh, this is the guinea pig uh, shots, uh, as we fondly called it. These are some scenes of uh, the EVA preparation. Uh, like everything else we do, uh, we've got checklists and make sure we go in, uh, in very great detail into the test and checkout, uh, particularly of critical components like the space suits. This is the uh, power ratchet tool that we're demonstrating. Uh, there's the tool itself and the controller and also uh, the torque limiter so that we um, wouldn't over torque any of the bolts. Uh, here we are in the airlock. Uh, uh, we're do doing our uh, pre-breathe here. We did uh, 40 minutes uh, prior to depressing the airlock. And there's not much you can do except uh, hang around and smile and wave. And that's what we did. <laughs> And uh, this is uh, the egress uh, from the airlock. It, uh, as I was going out, uh, it, it just really struck me how familiar uh, this was. And, and I just uh, have to hand it to all the training that we had in the, uh, in the WETF. Uh, really prepared us well uh, for uh, the, uh, 
experience of going out into the payload bay. And uh, we went right to work. Uh, I'm uh, out there on the, uh, the port side uh, uh, getting uh, Jim's uh, tether. He had a new tether that we were uh, uh, checking out. They were uh, setting up the, uh, our, one of our work sites, and, and I'm putting a bridge clamp there in order to be able to later on set up the uh, Hubble Space Telescope portable foot restraint. Carl is uh, doing his translation uh, technique there on the left, you can see, as I'm setting up one of the bolt probes there. And uh, this one uh, works a lot better than, than other methods. Uh, once you're up in space, it's painful in the, in the water tank because your head's down like hanging from a, from a, a high bar. But uh, we were then able to set up our, our work site uh, in this area here. And uh, I'm at uh, my work site forward uh, with the uh, power ratchet tool. And, uh, and then we uh, were able to test out. You can see one foot's out. And uh, we're doing is testing the, the pitch. And with one foot out and, and the other one from in there, we're able to position it and pitch quite easily. It's more interesting in yaw. There's uh, have to be fairly careful in order to avoid having the one remaining foot come out uh, of the, uh, the PFR. And it also shows, I think, in the next one, we'll show a close-up of how the foot is actually doing the, 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 the pedal movement. So with this, you can really, you don't have to get out of the PFR in order to reorient it, which is much more effective. And there you can see the boot pushing on the pedal, and then the other foot is doing its little torque routine in order to move it around. The uh, PFR two-step, we called it. And here I am uh, working with the uh, power ratchet tool. And uh, it, it worked quite well. Uh, you had to keep your body rates under control. Uh, we didn't have foot uh, a foot restraint for that task. Uh, the Hubble folks will. And I think that will uh, help them a lot. What we found is. Uh, uh, we could we could uh, do these uh, torques up to uh, 38 foot pounds, uh, but it made it easier. Uh, it would definitely make it easier to do it uh, uh, with uh, foot restraint to be able to help keep that body under control. And that was the flight deck scene. We had great help from uh, uh, Bill, uh, Dan, and uh, Frank. They're keeping us on the timeline um, and uh, doing a great job on the photography. Well, there were some incredible earth views as uh, the EVA was in progress, and uh, this is the skeleton coast, uh, Namibia and Africa. Some of the views uh, almost made it look like uh, the planet Mars underneath. The earth was so red. Uh, the only snag we really had uh, during the EVA was uh, when the PSA door jammed. And you can see here's some footage of uh, after getting some help from the ground here and selecting the proper tools for the job, uh, unjamming it. And here's our sign. And the group shot. The guys are in the window. <clears throat> well, next thing was, the, our next big event was the rendezvous, and here's Bill performing some of the uh, burns in preparation for the, uh, the final intercept. Jim set up with all his computers, and uh, in a moment you'll see one of the trajectories that was generated. This was the uh, projected TI burn, the intercept burn. And uh, here's a commander with not much to do while everybody else is doing all that work. <laughs> the um, SPAS was visible there, probably at about 12 miles. Uh, Dan was using the handheld laser, which he uh, was able to used very expertly. He got a, a mark out to 8,700 feet, which is the best we've ever been able to do with the handheld. Uh, there's the spas through the coas at about 400 feet. And uh, Dan was calling marks, feeding them to Bill, who was feeding that and radar data into the uh, PGSC and giving me good calls on what uh, he thought we needed for braking or, or corrections. This is the spas at about 200 feet, uh, slightly aft, as we were approaching at about 0.1 feet per second. Point one foot per second. Dan in the aft, aft window watching for this to happen. This is the view from the end effector as, the, uh, as we brought it down into the payload bay and uh, tried to get the grap grapple fixture as close to the end effector as I could so Dan didn't complain too much. But uh, at about this point, uh, Dan was saying, well, I'm getting ready to take the brakes off. And I said, OK, you got it. Free drift, yours. And he said, wait a minute. 
but he did a great job and, and uh, grappled very expeditiously. And uh, you can see how cleanly and, and uh, on target he came into the uh, grapple fixture. This is sped up just a little bit for the RMS folks that might be getting nervous out there. <laughs> but the, the object is to keep that little white dot inside that little white center or circle. And uh, he did a terrific job. And there's the grapple. And of course, we had a lot of activity to do after that, including getting set up for the Rick's camera operation, as, uh, as well as some manual flying on Bill's part. Bill, if you want to explain. Well, this is, uh, I think, a pretty unique and spectacular view of the forward part of the orbiter. Dan was flying the arm uh, with the uh, with, uh, Orpheus on it, which had that IMAX camera, as well as the Foresight camera, which was giving us these views. Uh, you can see the three forward-firing jets, the three up-firing jets of our reaction control system. And the, the keyhole Star there, kind of in front of uh, the windows, is a uh, Star Tracker. Flying the, uh, flying the Orpheus around the orbiter, we did a, a pretty thorough survey, and this is sped up a little bit also. You can see uh, going along the, the, port, uh, the port sill, there are the V-guides where uh, Orpheus is going to go back, and you can see the MPM, which is what supports the robot arm. Over across the bay, uh, if you look very closely, you can see the uh, Urpickle, our, our extended range uh, payload uh, communication link. There's the other part of the arm, and this is, I guess, probably one of our favorite views here. You can you can almost count threads there on the uh, on the tiles and the uh, and the blankets there for the uh, thermal yes, control system. Where Bill looked outside, we said, take a look outside, and next words out of his mouth were, holy mackerel, when he saw the payload out there. You can see the IMAX there in the window. We're trying to get IMAX of them taking IMAX of us. A little bit of cinema verite, I guess. Uh, as, uh, Dan goes back and, uh, and bursts the, uh, the Orpheus spas back in the payload bay. That's also sped up. <laughs> we did have a chance to look out the window a little bit. Uh, this, is, this is part of a photo frenzy in progress. We had uh, some spectacular views, and unfortunately, the video doesn't quite uh, do justice to some of the views we saw. The, this is Australia, and, um, and there the turquoise and blues of the water and the contrast with uh, some of the really intense red of the, the land was just uh, spectacular. You can see a little bit of sun glint down there in the uh, bottom center portion of the picture. It really does highlight uh, the little streams and, and tributaries that you wouldn't ordinarily see. This is taken out of uh, window six on the, on the pilot side. And we're going to zoom in here, and what you're seeing is the city of Brisbane, Australia. And it just turned out, uh, you know, we wound up with a night landing because um, with our takeoff time and a 10-day and a flight, uh, the United States kept on getting darker and darker and darker. And that meant that halfway around the world, of course, Australia, we had some spectacular views that were always sunlit. Uh, this is a view of South America, and uh, you can see what almost looks kind of like Edwards, California, and dry lake beds that they call Solars up there in the uh, in the Andes Mountains. Once again, some really incredible contrast between the uh, the really blazing white of uh, the dry lakes and and some of the reddish dirt that's surrounding it. The winds uh, in that area of the world blow at like about 80 miles an hour across those lakes. This is Madagascar. It's been uh, photographed quite a bit, and, and we do that on just about every shuttle flight to document uh, the erosion that we uh, are seeing and the silting up of uh, the harbor there at Betsaboka. And once again, the sun glint is pretty evident. This is uh, Africa at night. And what you're looking at there are thunderstorms. And uh, I think 
the size of the frame there is probably about 200 miles on a side. So you can see just how widespread the thunderstorms are and just uh, how incredible the electrical activity is, especially when you view it on a large scale like that. Well, eventually it was time to start wrapping everything up, and, and uh, we got ready for the second deorbit day. Uh, got up that morning pretty much ready to come back home. Uh, all we had to do was get into our suits and get into our seats and, and run through the timeline, get everything stowed, put all the film in a bag to bring it back to Houston. And you can see it's a lot easier to handle in zero-G than that heavy bag was after we landed. But that's a lot of different examples of our film. This was actually the first deorbit day when uh, uh, Jim had not arrived on the... Uh, Carl's big and small rack in the, uh, in the corner. But uh, here's a shot of the Terminator. You can see that the orbiter is, is traveling from light to dark. The Earth underneath is dark. The orbiter is still sunlit for quite a while, about four or five minutes after the, uh, the Earth experiences sun sunset below us. The entry itself, um, of course, requires uh, about four hours of work prior to reentry. There's Jim with his 51 and uh, all his electrodes on. Everybody's suited up at this point, uh, just about ready to do the deorbit burn. Uh, about a half an hour after the burn, we begin what we call entry interface, and this is the light show you see outside. I didn't see this on my first flight because we re-entered re in daylight, and I'm not sure how to felt if I'd have known what was going on out there, but uh, it was pretty spectacular. This shot was taken with an infrared camera, probably uh, over Orlando or in that vicinity. Uh, you can see the, how hot the leading edge of the wings and the nose cap are. Just, just prior to us rolling over onto the hack, coming across the coast, the Atlantic coast of Florida. Um, we rolled out on final, uh, followed the guidance, and uh, ended up over the runway. And there's the touchdown just as we come into the, the view of the xenon lights that illuminate the runway for us, since the orbiter does not have a landing light. Bill deployed the drag chute uh, just prior to derotation, and uh, that worked very well. It's a modified chute that uh, we think is an improvement over the ones we had before. Helps with the deceleration as well as the stability of the orbiter during rollout. You can see the nose wheel touch. We rolled out about uh, a little less than 9,000 feet. And, um, and uh, here's the jettison of the drag chute. This is a view from the nose of the orbiter looking back down the runway. And there goes the drag chute at about 60 knots. Came to a stop 